and welcome to the Real Estate Espresso Podcast, your morning shot of what's new in the world of real estate investing. I'm your host, Victor Manash. On today's show, we're taking a look at the so-called liquidity crunch to understand why it's happening. Is it just rumor or is the lack of liquidity real? On today's show, we have concrete proof as to why the credit markets are seizing up. A few months ago, it was simply a thesis that the regional banks were losing deposits to the major banks. These medium-sized banks have been under pressure ever since the failure of Silicon Valley Bank. The outflow of capital has been largely to the benefit of the larger banks like J.P. Morgan Chase, Wells Fargo, and Bank of America. But the outflow has not been a zero-sum game. A recent review of the Federal Reserve Bank of St. Louis data set shows that nearly $1 trillion in deposits have left the banking system completely since June of 2022. The bulk of that decline has been in the last eight weeks. Back in June, there was $18.1 trillion in deposits in U.S. banks, and today that number is down to $17.1 trillion. Somewhere along the way, $1 trillion vanished from the banking system. The question is, where did it go? Some of those funds went to the U.S. government as people pay their taxes. They went from depositors in bank accounts into the U.S. Treasury general account. But then the U.S. government turns around and spends that money in the economy. And the U.S. government also is supposed to maintain a minimum reserve of $500 billion. That reserve has been bled down to effectively zero. The U.S. government will be out of cash in about a week. If they succeed in raising the debt ceiling, they will also need to replenish that $500 billion reserve, which will take even more money out of the banking system. Either that or they're going to need to print it. In our fractional reserve banking system, banks need to maintain sufficient reserves to pay depositors their funds. Even if you put fractional reserve lending aside, a $1 trillion shortfall in deposits is at least the equivalent of $1 trillion in new loans that will not get written. In truth, it can be much, much more than that. So what will happen to those assets in commercial real estate that need to refinance? Many of those loans were written in the last 10 to 15 years when interest rates were near historic lows. Once that debt rolls over, the interest rate on the new paper is going to be much higher. And if those assets were struggling with low occupancy as the result of the pandemic, they'll be completely upside down with the higher debt service costs. We see the downtown offices in many major metros having high vacancy rates near 30%. That's the case in San Francisco, New York, Houston, to name just a few. We've already seen several high-profile defaults by major brand names like Brookfield Asset Management and Blackstone in those markets. The consensus among investors that I speak with is that we have not yet even begun to see the wave of distress that we know is going to hit this year. But the distress is not limited to commercial office. As we've talked about on the show before, we can expect problems in the multifamily apartment sector. There already have been a few high-profile bankruptcies and foreclosures. The failure of Apple's Way Investment Group with the loss of more than 3,000 apartments back in April, made the front page of the Wall Street Journal. A deeper dive on the same story was also front page news in the Wall Street Journal on Tuesday of this week. But in that article, syndicators were all thrown together as guilty by association. I know several of the people named in the Wall Street Journal article. The use of variable rate bridge debt for projects that were supposed to be value-add projects is very common in the industry. And that strategy is not a problem in and of itself. In the case of Apple's Way, there was a case of a rookie student putting too much emphasis on raising capital, growing the portfolio, maximizing leverage, and not putting the proper emphasis on operations. These projects are all difficult to execute. They require hiring the best people and making changes to the projects to maximize their performance. But not all projects are candidates for the classic value-add techniques where you raise rents, and the owners at Appleway figure that out, but only too late. You can raise the rent, but if you're in a C-class apartment segment, you're eventually going to run out of tenants willing or even able to pay the higher rent. Some may choose to stay at the higher rent, but you will ultimately spend all of your time in collections. Properties in Houston saw their insurance premiums increase between 500% to 700%. The insurance increase alone would be enough to sink most projects. Will there be more distress in multifamily apartments? Absolutely. I believe the answer is yes. I'm getting phone calls from apartment owners who are already seeing the writing on the wall. Does that mean all syndicators are bad? Not in the least. The fact is the majority of what we've witnessed in bank distress so far has been with good assets. 
and next to no distress. If lending dries up, as I believe is already underway, we can expect a wave of defaults across many aspects of commercial real estate. It's not a matter of a bank's willingness to lend. In many cases, it'll be the outright inability to lend, all the while making the borrower feel like it's the borrower's fault. As you think about that, have an awesome rest of your day. Go make some great things happen. We'll talk to you again tomorrow.